Welcome everybody to the Rick Deckerkopf's lecture titled Figure Ground Malukan Farming Method Explained. It's really, really an honor to continue Marsha Malukan's legacy with the speaker, Derek Deckerkopf, today. Before to introduce him, I would like to explain that in this moment, the streaming is in English and we are recording the simultaneous interpretation in Spanish to upload in our social media channels on YouTube and Facebook after the talk. Thanks a lot for the interpreters today. They are Lucia Bonilla and Maria Eugenia Sous. Okay, I would like to mention a brief biography of the Rick Deckerkopf. He is former director of the McLuhan Program in Culture and Technology at the University of Toronto, where he is Professor Emeritus at the Department of French. He subsequently joined the Faculty of Sociology of the University Federico II in Naples. And presently he is scientific director of the Rome-based monthly, monthly Media Duemila. He is author of a dozen books edited in over 10 languages, including English, Italian, French, Spanish, Portuguese, Brazilian, Slovenian, Polish, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean. He is also research director at the Interdisciplinary Internet Institute at L'Universitat Oberta de Catalunya in Barcelona. Especially in Cultural Ring in Uruguay, we had the pleasure that Rick participated last year in the online Congress in Education and New Media as a special EVT in the Monica Fleischmann's and Wolfgang Strauss inaugural lecture. Also, we had today with one of their uh, good friend of the Derek Decker Cup. Uh, thanks, Derek, for accepting the invitation and to prepare an amazing presentation in Spanish considering our main target audience. Go ahead, Derek. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Elma. Thank you also for inviting me. It's always such a pleasure to uh, talk about Macron, although I have to say right away, uh, this is not really about Macron, it's just about continuing Macron. And I'll explain how I'm doing this and, and, and why, uh, because I listened to the conferences by uh, Andrew McLuhan, which was absolutely spectacular. I could never talk about Marshall the way Andrew did. Uh, and I also listened to, uh, I had to listen in Spanish, in fact, to Paolo Granata because you send me two Spanish <laughs> versions. Anyway, it was okay. I understood most of what he was saying. And so both of them were very, very good. Now, what I am planning to do is to, I'm going to put, the, should I share the screen now? Okay, so there we go. And, there we are. Oops. What's up? No, that's not right. Oh dear. Don't tell me I'm having that kind of problem again. Let me just unshare for the while. No, I can I have to do it again. Share. This is what I was trying to share. Oh no. I see. It's gone away. Oh, I hate that. Excuse me. Just give me a one second. This is not supposed to be what I was sharing. I had it right before and then it disappeared. Let me see. I have a lot of stuff and so finding it is a, is, is a, a real challenge. Okay, back to the presentation. Where on earth is it gone? Okay, let's see the recent one. No, you sent out oh here. That's, that's in English, I don't need that. Let me go back to it. You can open the file and then share a screen when, when you open the file of the I know, but I have to find it. I was so sure that it was going to be there that uh, I, I didn't, didn't bother. Let me just go and see. Okay, now I've got it, but I have to move away, which doesn't make any sense. Um, let's see if I can do it this way. Share screen again. And then how about that? Do you see it now? Do you see it? No, no in this moment. 
but you you are turn on the button share screen. Oh, there we go. Thing. Now now it's back now. Okay, that now okay. you see. Yes, perfect. You know what I <laughs> I find, I have so can Maurice bonjour. I have so much trouble with this new system, and it works. Anyway, I'm not going to say anything nasty about Apple, but I feel a lot of nasty things about Apple. So anyways, um, I think this has to be one of the most silly titles I've ever given to any conferences <laughs> that I was going to, to give. What happened was, I imagined myself like Charles Gardiner. You remember the film being there? I thought, you know, Marshall McLuhan is talking about figure and ground. And he insists a lot on the, the ground being the source of the figures, which of course makes perfect sense. And I imagine the ground of technology producing flowers, producing their own sort of, you know, the innovations. And what would these flowers look like? And why would they be related to the same fields? That was what I thought was really the ex exciting thing to do. And then also what principles guide those figures to the shapes that they that they acquire. Mc Marshall McLuhan had a tremendous amount of uh, grounds and figures to talk about, and uh, I will only talk about three of them, and I get to them very soon. <clears throat> and he also said that a figure could be a ground to, to, to another. You could make a figure become a ground to new figures coming up. So this is what he says here. Uh, in the uh, actual environment, uh, which has been created as the from the previous technologies, new technologies come up, and at at their turn, they they actually affect society and individuals. And the message that the medium trans, transmits can not be understood unless it is analyzed together uh, between the medium and the environment that it's creating, and at the same time that is affected. So to examine the figure ground relationship can help a critical perspective on culture and society. And I take this from my colleague and friend, uh, Robert Logan, who has written a wonderful paper on McLuhan figure and ground. And in fact, if you want to have, a, if, if the students or people who are interested in this want to have it, of course, I make this available to them, but I can also give them a little bibliography, which contains quite specifically some of these, some of these wonderful things. So here's the overview. <clears throat> the method is relationship between ground and figures. You will see how that works. The grounds are the literate ground, which is the base, the uh, digital ground, which is the one that is taking, has taken over and is actually running the world today. You have to remember that the, the, the literate ground has been running the world for 2000 years and more. So, we are very recently in an absolutely new ground and both grounds are fighting against each other. And I want to get to that point as well. And then I lead this to the, the quantic, the quantic quantum physics, the quantic ground, because I think it's the one that's coming. I claimed at some point that uh, we are today at about the same level of development of the quantum physics that let's say the middle, early middle nineties digital culture was. And last, uh, the talk that I heard from Andrew, Andrew was saying something that I thought very interesting. He said, uh, if you can imagine that today we understand McLuhan 60 years after he wrote what he was writing, predicting all of this over a span of 60 years, what is it that we're missing today <laughs> that we're not predicting? And so in some fashion, this is a beginning modest response to that challenge, which is exactly how can we predict what's going to happen coming out of the, the quantum physics. So the, uh, and then the, 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 um, the figures are so numerous that I will probably concentrate more on three main ones. Every time that you have a new ground, it creates its own sense of time and that was again beautifully expressed by Andrew, its own space. And I added to other people's study of time and space, its own self. It, and I believe that we are somehow here in front of three major coordinates of our lives. We are somewhere, we are somebody. In quantum physics, you have to be careful saying that, but in the present time, we are a person, 
and we live, and it seems that we live continuously in a continuous time, uh, and and uh, in a in a in infinite space. In fact, after inventing the alphabet, the Greek philosophers uh, talked about things that they call the apeiron. Apeiron means without limit. That's the time of literacy, uh, and so or rather the space of literacy. The fields, what are the fields? The fields are, of course, the technologies, but they are also economies, the whole economy depending today more and more on digital than it did on the previous distribution of objects and services. Uh, and of course, the ecology, a whole, I was very pleased again to listen from Andrew talking about the fact that ecology was discovered by Marshall to be born out of the planet being surrounded by a human technology, which was Sputnik. Uh, ecology was born, he says. Well, yes, ecology now is becoming much, much more important, not only because of pandemics and the things we have gone through, and because we are threatened by disasters, and we are not only threatened, we're actually attacked by disasters, but also because ecology actually shows the interrelation and interpenetration of everything, and that's very quantum. So we'll have to talk a bit about that. Principles. I will not spend a lot of time on principles. I more or less leave that to the end when I talk about quantum. But what it is, the basic principle of the literacy and the basic principle of, of uh, communication media, all of those that McLuhan studied, is to create meaning. That's the fundamental, that's the job of communication. And by comparison, the job of the digital culture is to turn, forget meaning, they're not interested in meaning, they don't need it. You know, you can do anything without meaning, including with GPT-3, create all kinds of stuff. So there's no need for meaning in digital culture. What you need is algorithms. What you need is ordering. You need to command. That's what you need. And you can affect a lot of things, including communication, of course, by using commands. And then the basic principle of quantum physics is what is called entanglement. And I don't know whether the entrelaciamiento miento is a <clears throat> sufficiently good translation, but entanglement is, a, is an adopted word to describe one of the two main principles of quantum physics. One is uncertainty, which is a very interesting to describe. I'll get to it. Uh, why uncertainty? Or does it mean that you don't know what you're talking about? Well, there's a bit of that, but, um, but anyway. So those are the principles. And I want to talk about today's problem, which I call the epistemological crisis. It is the encounter, unfriendly encounter, between the alphabet and the digital culture. They don't agree. They seem to. They pretend to. The digital pretends to serve people, but it uses people. Whereas the alphabet was creating individuals, the digital is taking the individual out of each of us. So we're gonna, we have to deal with that you know, conflict, which eventually will find its way out. We will get out of the pandemic and the infidemic and all the fake news that we have to go through, but we're not there yet. So that's the, and that's why I say uh, quantum physics will come to the, hopefully will come to the rescue. So next, this is the very ugly image that McLuhan used to use used for us to show the difference between figure and ground. You must have seen it middle, you know, millions of times. Uh, if you look at one way, you see an old lady with a very nasty sort of, you know, huge nose, but the huge nose becomes the cheek of a, what apparently might be a pretty young girl. So not only is this a horrible sexist <laughs> design, but it's also uh, ugly from the point of view of, um, the actual aesthetics of it. Um, but it, it is useful to show. Why did McLuhan like this? Well, because it really, Marshall was somebody who looked for perception. He was not that interested in concepts. It was actually very, an, very hostile to conceptual approach. Uh, he accused me of being conceptual and he was right. I was brought up in France and I was brought up a Cartesian, right? Descartes, classification, concepts and all those things. So it's, a, and I never got, rid of it. So I'm somewhere between quantum physics and Newton in my thinking, and that's not a good place to be. 
but in any case, um, that's what it is. So he found that, that, that uh, uh, Gestalt theory, which was based on training perception, was probably one of the ways by which one could uh, understand better things and uh, understand it also in dynamic way. When you, when you have to distinguish a figure from a ground, you have to play with the image. In fact, I'll show you a nice play in the next, next slide. But so the idea was that you could, you could make more sense of the context in which you were living by seeing from which ground uh, it, the figures and the thing. Uh, and then he also noticed this very important thing that figures are the thing that appear first. And most people don't pay attention to the ground. They, they are so obsessed with the figure. When, they, when you know, the, the medium is a message, people don't know that the medium has much more power over their thinking and their way of behaving than the content of that medium because the content is the figure and it's just, it's just there. And then you take for granted that it's either presented on a screen or in a page or in a road sign. And so this is, this is what he said, we must find out ways of deciphering what happens behind the figures. Um, we can sometimes also, he says, project the figure as a, as, as a ground and uh, create then images of the future. So this is a very interesting kind of, of uh, statement that he makes. Here is a very nice <laughs> figure ground uh, painting by Dali. And if you pay attention, you're gonna see all kinds of figures emerging from the ground. And I wanted to show you that one because of that sort of comparison. So um, what do you see? <laughs> I see a dog somewhere. Do you see the dog? A dog, yes. <laughs> you see a dog. <laughs> no. A young person's face. <laughs> Yes, the and then I see, uh, interestingly, the usual image that people show for the Gestalt theory of figure ground, they show uh, a vase created by two faces facing each other. Uh, it appears that uh, Dali was aware of that because he creates the vase as a face instead of the vase produced from the face. You see a fish also. Uh, what does that fish do? <laughs> it creates a pond. So there's all kinds of, of, of all, you know, if you, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you can study it and you can find us at, at least 25 or 30 figures. It takes time to get to that number, but you will find them because they're there. And, and I think Dali liked that very much, whether he was a gestaltist, that's another question. I haven't studied the matter. Uh, another great figure ground fellow you all recognize, I'm sure, MC Escher. Uh, Escher here actually creates movement and dynamics and, and, and also uh, puzzlement. You know, so this is night today and day to night and you can see the same place, exactly the same place, but in a kind of a negative uh, format as you would see in a negative, we don't see negatives anymore because we are using digital photography, but the negative was exactly a figure ground relationship. And so that's another one of these, uh, of these marvelous works. Um, this is an old slide, but it's one to remember nevertheless. Uh, it's the fact that for the longest pe period of time, humans were dependent only on language and spoken language. And that meant that they had to be within distance of each other. That meant that they had to remember everything, that they had to, their whole psychology was based on repetition. And so there was a whole lot of psychology that came around from that condition, that oral condition that McLuhan has described beautifully. And then when you think about the, uh, the only 300 generations of literacy, of writing, and I mean lit not literacy for everybody because you can't call Chinese literacy. It's an entirely different system of, of representing things. Um, but still 300 generation of writing creates an extraordinary you know, acceleration of culture. And then 35 generation of printing, which further accelerates by distributing the same product to various parts of the world or various parts of the local area. So you have this extraordinary, you have these three stages of uh, acceleration. Communicating orally is one thing, communicating by writing is further. 
communicating by, by friends. And then you suddenly have communication by electricity and, and all the generations of, of uh, technologies that have appeared in the last 20 years. So or more, I would say the last, uh, the last, well, if you take the whole of electricity, then you have to think about a hundred years, but uh, right now, and I say, these are the technologies of language. And I don't talk about quantum physics here because we don't know how quantum physics is going to deal with language, whether it is continuing the tendency of removing it uh, that you find in a digital culture or not. The fact is a digital culture, even as it makes language less and less pertinent, has based its development on it, obviously, produces linguistic structures and communication forms. But it's something that uh, it, it sort of, as it eliminates further, we want to know whether we'll be sort of somehow, well, whether there will be no more interval between us and the environment, us and the world. And it's a question that will rise again with quantum physics because of our interdependence that we have. So um, I want to just say, uh, to, to show something that McLuhan wouldn't probably like at all, uh, the idea that you, tr you try and find a cause and effect relationship between uh, the ground and its figures. Although he does imply cause and effect, um, and he was totally fascinated by the issue of the alphabet, um, he, doesn't, he doesn't try to connect the dots. He doesn't try to prove it scientifically. And that's what I did. Because of my Cartesian background, I thought I actually had to take what was the principal object of research and consideration of the Toronto School of Communication. You heard about it from uh, Paolo Granata and also from Andrew. Um, this Toronto School of Communication is united by the same concentration on the effects of the alphabet. So I decided, okay, I am going to study that and see why the alphabet has had this, this is importance and so on. So with Charles Lamson, we edited this, this book called The Alphabet in the Rain, and it has 25 uh, scientists of very different fields, uh, neurology, uh, graphology, uh, la linguistic studies, it really, uh, the book sank without a trace. It didn't make anybody famous, at least of all me or of Charles, but it was at least an attempt at giving a scientific ground to what uh, McLuhan was, was uh, saying about how the alphabet had totally destroyed, and in that he was following Innes, the ancient, more ancient Greek culture. It was very interesting. How did the Greeks resist the Consequence of the Alphabet is one of the main chapters of Harold Innes' book, Empires and Communication. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of interesting. Anyway, so um, here's an example. Um, this is where I've said you have to look at things in, in this uh, presentation. So you have two diagonals, and I ask you to say which one goes up and which one goes down. Take your time. If you have not made up your mind, look at this. We look at reality moving from the left to the right. We, the writers of the alphabet. Hebrew and Arabic people would actually say the contrary. What does that mean? That means that the actual writing system that we practice regularly since we are children has introduced a bias in our way of interpreting space, which stayed with us. And how did that happen? And that's really the basis of the argument in the book. So, you know, why do we Occidental people write to the right? Well, I've had, I have it in Spanish here and I have it in English on the other side. So I'm going to stick to the English on the other side. So according to science, and it is proven, even though there's been a lot of discussion pro and con about whether the, elf, the, the, the brain was really that divided in its function. There is a lot of crossover. You have a cup corpus callosum, cuerpo calloso, you can see there, which ties them both. But what is clearly appearing as people more, even the most recent scientists and neuroscientists that have studied it, have clearly identified that there are different functionalities in the left and the right hemisphere. And why would that be? Because they are complementary. You need to see things in a certain way, in a certain order, in order to make sense of space in front of you. So the left brain does analyze analytic thought, logic, language, reasoning, 
science, mathematics, written materials, numbers, skills, right hand control, and by opposition, the right brain is more holistic, deals with sensibility and art, creativity, imagination. People make too much of this, and that's why there was so much criticism, but by and large, it is more or less one way to say, on the one side, you have an analyt analytic approach, and on the other, you have a more holistic approach. So imagination takes more information from the right side of the brain, uh, intuition and all these things. This is where um, it becomes a little bit more technical, but still useful. We, of course, have something that most people take for granted because they don't realize it, and it's not, you know, you can't perceive it, but our eyes are divided in two visual fields, each one. We think we only have two visual fields, one from the left eye and the other from the right eye. No, we have four visual fields, and they are integrated. And they are integrated in such fashion that it proves exactly how the brain works to present the visual environment. The left visual fields are at, at, attached to the right, uh, the right brain. They go, as you can see, they are blue here, and you can see they cross over and go to the right brain, whereas the right visual field go to the left brain. And that's it. That's called, and in fact, animals have it too. They have it in different fashion. And of course, a rabbit is not the same as a human because the eyes are on each side and the, and the horse as well. But generally speaking, there is a separation of the visual fields that is uh, uh, con consistent. Um, the visual fields that are governed by the right hemisphere are disposed for a holistic global vision. Those on the left hemisphere are actually emphasizing analysis. And you have to just remember that. It's very simple. So the totally alphabetic, I mean, I say totally, that is a writing which contains a, a continuous representation of the sounds of human voice, of the sounds of speech. The, the complete alphabetic uh, writing requires the, uh, the dominance of analysis over holistic of our global vision. So what are the effects? The Semitic languages, that is Arabic and, uh, and Hebrew, among others, and Ethiopian, um, don't need vowels. And this is a very interesting reason. They don't need vowels because vowels play a grammatical role, but not a lexical one. What I mean by that, vowels put the words together in an order that you can understand, but they are not needed to identify words in Semitic language. Whereas in, in the Indo-European languages, of which Spanish and, and English and French are, the presence of a vowel in words makes a difference between the one word and the other. So that it was possible for an economy of signs, particularly because the invention of the Phoenician alphabet, which is the first Semitic alphabet invented, was done by people who were working as slaves for Egyptians. And Egyptians were also a Semitic language. And so Egyptians had had a, a way of writing that allowed them to make things faster. It's very long to make a little design every time you want to say something, especially if you don't code it the way the Chinese did. So it's in order to save time, they would have designs and they would have an initial little sign, which was a sound. And that was a, a consonant sound, a hard sound. And so what the, the slaves, in order to create their own language, their secret code, as they were working to dig in turquoise in Petra, what they did was to um, use just, they got rid of all the design. They didn't need the design. They were definitely going to translate the language into sound, written sound, as opposed to image. And so what he did was to just use the, that little sign that the Egyptians were putting in front. And so because the Egyptian did not have a need for vowels any more than the, than the Phoenician, they stuck to a 22 letter alphabet and that was it. When the Greek traders began to connect with the Phoenicians, both Greeks were selling things and they were, you know, traversing the Mediterranean and they were conquering also eastward uh, all the way to India. When they started doing these things, they met these various cultures and they realized that the Phoenicians had a very intelligent way of, you know, uh, making a list of what they, uh, what they were selling and what they were buying. And they realized th th those Phoenicians are really clever, but we can't do that because we don't have vowels. 
So they took the what was called the weak signs of Phoenician, turned them into vowels, doubled the number of vowels because Greek was very prosodic and had long sounds and short sounds, and then created the uh, created the the phonetic alphabet. So what happened was once that alphabet had taken over, once the Greek alphabet was completed, it required an entirely different strategy from the brain to read it. Whereas reading a, a sequence without vowels and having to actually fill in the missing, uh, the missing letters, you had to guess the meaning across the whole sentence. The Greeks and the Roman later created what's called scriptio continua, continuous writing, without even stopping for the end of a sentence or a paragraph. They just had complete in two directions at first, and then it eventually adopted the right word direction. But what's interesting is that required an, a different strategy, and it's the one that depended on that left hemisphere or the right hemisphere, I would say. Uh, no, yeah, the left hemisphere, which is to analyze. And so that it is the Greek writing that introduced the analytical principle as the basis from which the Western world was built. Analyzing, measuring, uh, comparing, uh, rationality, and, and, and all these things. These are the figures of alphabetization. The theater became the archetype of Occidental cognition. Why? Because the theater was invented in order to separate the spectator from the spectacle. Once you, you, once you oblige people to sit down in front of something which was in front of you as a spectacle, which was a symbolic thing, suddenly you were putting a mind outside, outside in front and people would integrate the model of the mind as a model of consciousness. That doesn't mean that before the theater, nobody had consciousness. Although some people claim that, but I wouldn't believe that. But what it means that is the idea of separating what you see from what you, the thing you see from how you see became the norm. The idea of separating, separating the interior and the exterior, the knower from what is known, objective from subjective, Dis distanciament, <laughs> we know about that word now, creating the point of view. So this kind of separation, which is exactly what quantum physics is against, quantum physics says it's a mistake to separate the objective and the subjective. But then so that's also uh, fake news. So we have to take all of this with a grain of salt. But it's fundamental, the separation between external. Uh, Andrew addressed it too in his talk. Um, and of course, the printing press multiplied and expanded and de deployed all the effects of the alphabet. Um, theorizing became the norm. And spatializing uh, as well, when uh, when uh, when Shakespeare uses the image of the theater to talk about that precisely, he says that all the world's a stage and men and women are nothing but actors. Everybody interprets that as if he was saying that we're all hypocrites, right? We're actors. But no, we're acting. We're acting as individual elements in a fixed environment, in a fixed stage. So that's a that's, uh, specialization. And of course, causality, narratization. Uh, it's interesting, you'll see at the end that. Causality is one of the major um, object of um, refusal from quantum physics. Uh, it's even very difficult today to even say something like, you know, we have waves and particles and particles are made by, by the collapse of waves. No, that's too causal <laughs> for thinking in physics because all physics of Newton, all classical physics is based on causality, but causality and history arrives with the Greeks. So we find that all of Newton's basic theories start with Thales, with uh, Anaximander, with uh, all the all the, uh, Democritus who invents the atom. Imagine inventing the atom without ever having seen one. Coming with the analytic mind in such ways you could say the world is made of little, they must have seen sand and then smaller sand and and powder and so all all elements come down to very small bits and they call it the atomos the undividable that's that was a pure rational analytical decision to make about reality um 
So let's get more to the to next one. Yeah, I, I just explained that so we can skip. But um, the theater separated the actor from the, oh yeah, that's the other thing, the actor from the chorus. The ancient Greek tragedy had uh, three major elements. You had the Corypheus, who was the leader of the chorus. And the chorus was the, the people from Athens who were you know, on the stage and they were dancing, interpreting what the Corypheus was saying or what the actor was saying. And at first you had just one actor and then uh, Sophocles brought another actor and then uh, suddenly and a, and a third one. And then you had a separation between the actors and the chorus. And the chorus generally did not agree with what the actors were saying. So it's very interesting that the dialectic process is born also. Uh, on the stage. Um, the deep interiorization of the, uh, of the stage becomes the imagination that produces, uh, that is produced by reading novels. So that we got, you know, the European culture sort of, they didn't get rid of theater, but they, it became less and less pertinent because you could replace theater by novels. And the novels, what they were doing was to enrich you and include many, many more content in your mind so that you actually became a, you know, a cultivated person. But it did much more than that. And this is why I'm saying space and time, yes, but also self. What happens with the text of the, uh, the Greek uh, alphabet? It separates the text from the context. You can pull a sequence. You can even pull a sequence in a language you don't know and eventually find somebody who knows it and can translate it for you because it comes out completely. So the text is unified. You take it out from the context, but the moment you take a text from a context, you can start creating new text and new context. Then the second thing, very important, you disconnect the text from the, from the reader. When uh, Harold Innes, one great influence on McLuhan, says the separation of the knower from the known, what he is really saying is actually separating the text from the reader, making the text objective and the reader subjective. Separating the reader from the context is even more serious because that is the origin of the religious wars. The context in a religious culture is the religion. It is the whole system. Uh, the most beautiful buildings are made on, in honor of this religion. The code of law is built on the religion. There is no separation between the state and the church. Religion becomes the absolute foundation of, 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 of the social behavior. But once the people can start reading and make up their own mind about what it is that they are reading, then becomes heresies and schism and uh, the question from the Spanish Inquisition. Sorry, I'm talking to Spanish people, but you did have Spanish Inquisition. And the, the Spanish Inquisition was something like what's happened today, except it was much more violent. Uh, today, uh, you know, algorithm gets right into our mind. They know exactly how we think. They can actually translate everything we say. You know, we, you can actually, did you know that today there are technologies that can read your time? When you are reading, they can read what you are reading and translate it into text because they can follow the muscular movement of your sub-vocalization, you know? So we don't need the Inquisition anymore. But the point is, that's what it is. The, the secularization of culture came from this separation of the reader from the context. More important, the appropriation for your own use of language. And how did that happen? By silencing it. It took a long time before the majority of people were capable of reading silently. But what happens if you are reading language silently? You privatize it. It's not meant for somebody else. It is meant for you thinking. It's actually turning language in a very disciplined and powerful tool for, 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 for structuring your thought and for you know, coming up with new things. So the silencing of language is the moment, it's a benchmark, it's the moment when suddenly yourself becomes privatized. You are owner of yourself. Today, we're not owners of ourselves anymore. We, you know, we take selfies, we, we give ourselves all around the world. And it's something which is very different from, a, it's very different from, from the, that situation where we be, began to develop a content for ourselves. This is the imagine of ourself, you know, um, Sometimes I ask my students, uh, 
tell me about uh, your last walk in a forest. Well, how do you see it? And I ask you to do it. I ask everybody here too. Uh, your last walk in the forest. Uh, do you see yourself in the forest or do you see the, the, the trees around you? And you know what? Most people see themselves in the forest. They don't, some people do. And I found that more women than men, but it's not a unilateral observation. It should be done much better than I have done. It should be really studied. More women than men are capable of seeing the forest rather than seeing themselves. Whereas, uh, but by, these are two options and these options are available to you in virtual reality, second life and all those things. It, the idea that we have the possibility of shifting from imagining ourselves in the context or actually seeing ourselves in that context. But then the two things came, up, came together, being able to see oneself uh, inside and seeing also the shape of a self outside on the stage. So the stage was educating also in the body image and the experience of the body image uh, for the Western man. And then of course, the press, the printing press, filled the mind with all these contents, uh, historical, uh, no, no, novelistic, uh, aesthetic, and, and, and all sorts of things of that nature. Plus comes the mechanization of the body. The idea, the church would absolutely forbid people to, you know, open the body and study it. But once you had this analytical bias to know how the body functioned, to turn the body as a machine, as a la maîtrise, a French a, the a philosopher said uh, 150 years later, that the idea that we wear machines becomes when you can actually open and see how the machine works. So this mechanization of the body uh, became one of the trends that followed. So all of this is part of the fields of figures that uh, were brought by, by, uh, by, the printing, by the printing press in particular. The Renaissance idea of man, central, is a man, not a woman, uh, totally proportionate, with you know the the body is the measure of all things. Man is the measure of all things. That's the Renaissance idea, putting man at the center of reality. But at the same time, this centrality is both affirmed by painting and by uh, drawings and so on. But it, but also the idea that Copernicus revolution sort of puts the you know the idea of this just. The, the earth is not the center anymore. The sun is not the center anymore. The, the galaxy is not the center anymore. So there's both centering man as the possessor, the manager of the earth, and man as simply a very small thing in a very much larger, much larger universe. Here are, uh, it's a wonderful, this is a fabulous painting, uh, or rather a uh, uh, forte uh, engraving. Um, and I forgot who did it. And all, all your images are, are covering the, uh, the other thing. But it represents um, prudence as a virtue and measurement. And you can see that people are learning to read here. They are counting there. They are watching a play here. They are learning uh, uh, singing there uh, accompanied by the organ and some trumpets. Uh, and here again, more measuring goes on. Here is uh, astrology. So it's kind of a temperance is the goddess or the saint protecting all the innovations and all the uh, learning and the stu studying that. And I wanted to show this just to say, well, that's a, that's a field. You have a field of all the figures. They all correspond to the same principle of measuring and making meaning. So that's the thing. Now, we are going to go on to our second round. And I was wondering whether there was any time for questions because we decided that we would stop uh, every now and then to allow people to ask questions or make comments uh, to take a rest. Go ahead. Adelante. Me? No, the people. <laughs> yes, exactly. The people, the audience connected. Fernando Andrade, go ahead, please. Hello. Hello, Professor Kerkhoff, uh, wonderful lecture. I was wondering uh, if you have any thoughts on another Canadian uh, scholar from the social sciences, Irving Goffman, and his idea of frame, frame analysis. 
I yes. think that with his study, what he calls uh, the, the study of the experience uh, is connected to what you presented as the obliviousness we have to the ground and our concentration of the figure and how we miss how much it exerts a pressure on us, this uh, medium, this ground. And so uh, in his work, Irving Goffman sort of discovered what he calls the interaction order. That is, and he uses famously enough the theater at the beginning as his model, but I think more important than the theater, which I, I really like the way you presented uh, the separation of, of the spectator from the spectacle, right? Uh, our possibility um, of having this theater of consciousness, observing ourselves being observed by playwrights uh, from the Greek to Shakespeare and so on. So would you say there is any possible theoretical epistemological link between frame analysis in the way that Irving Goffman developed it and what you're presenting as the ground and figure in McLuhan's thought? Yes, actually, uh, totally because actually my first book on the matter was called Brain Frames. And it was exactly that. The idea was to see what are the, what are the routines, what's the architecture of mind that actually supports a certain way, eliminates a lot in order to focus on specific things. I think I, I started with McLuhan because uh, uh, Delma was interested in continuing the McLuhan dimension, but uh, I could have started just on, on what I've been doing myself. Uh, I owe everything to McLuhan anyway, so I can just confess and that's it. Uh, I owe more to McLuhan than to Goffman, but I think Goffman is a very important uh, thinker about these things. And I think that we should go back to Goffman now, uh, not just to talk about frames, but to analyze the architecture of those frames. It's we need now more and more. We should we need it absolutely. For example, uh, when we study things like the social dilemma, you have seen this film, right? It's about how young people are being teleguided by uh, big uh, companies and platforms. Uh, they are we, we we are being invaded. It's it's happening regularly, and there's nobody protesting. A few a few intellectuals do, but. By and large, we are, and we're taking it off. All of this is happening without knowing how it is happening. And I think this is where Goffman would be very useful uh, on studying uh, manipulation at a distance, hidden grounds. That's a, you know, that's a hidden ground. Ma Marshall talked about hidden grounds as well. Well, he felt that grounds were hidden by nature, but there are hidden grounds to grounds. <laughs> so it's a lot of, there's great value in unearthing. And as, as a matter of fact, I can tell you that the, the alphabet in the brain for me was an, a, an attempt at understanding something about myself and about people. I was trying to go down, dig down into the deepest I could of what I knew about myself and, and, and the people. And I'm not narcissistic. I'm not, I don't consider myself terribly important, but I do feel important to know more about one's What's ground, in fact? And then, so why do I move from the alphabet and the brain to my next book? Because it's, we just sent it to the publisher. It's called uh, The Quantum Ecology. Uh, because that, too, is digging all the way down to the smallest element, smallest manifestation of. Uh, I would. <laughs> I have a problem calling it matter because quantum physics doesn't like the word matter. But it is true that if there is anything that supports this, I mean, <laughs> this is my view here. You can see I have a mountain in front of me and, uh, and, and, and that mountain is made of extremely movable substance. <laughs> it's, not, it's not firm, it's not fixed, it's not, doesn't. I, my, the last part of the book, I say, you know, when you dream, you create your dream and you, are belie you believe absolutely in it, right? You are the center of it and you, it and you occupy it and you wake up and you go, well, I'm glad that's over, uh, you know, but what happened is that you have, you have a mind made in such a way to produce that illusion of reality, that centrality of action and, at all, and, and you have all this available and then you wake up and the same thing happens outside. You know, wasn't it, uh, I think it was, it was James Joyce who said history is, <laughs> is a nightmare I would like to wake up from. I can tell you history is becoming a nightmare today. There's no doubt about that. But this is why, what I was saying was, 
using also the example of the aboriginals of Australia, whose job, some, some tribes said that their job was to dream the world. They had to dream the world to make sure it was continued. Well, maybe we're doing that, <laughs> you know? And so that what I'm seeing here is an epiphany. It's, it wasn't there before. It won't be there tomorrow, but it will be, it'll, I will be there making it tomorrow come, as I was there making it yesterday but it isn't anywhere but in the moment I see it. That's a very quantum physics approach to reality. Reality as an epiphany, not as a continuity. Well, that's huge. Of course, it's, it's a bit unsettling also. So that's, uh, that, I'm sorry to take so long to answer you, but well, thank you for the question. It's a wonderful- No, thank you. Thank you very much for the answer. Thank you. Sorry, anybody else? I say a few words about that because I, I think it's a very important point. Uh, we uh, definitely consider that re reality is something that has a substance because we have a feeling we see it. But we know that most of the matter we see around us is uh, uh, full of emptiness. Mm -hmm. and, and the distance between the particles is so big that uh, we should go through. And, and I really like the idea that instead of materiality, we are uh, experiencing forces that give us the impression that there is a kind of uh, physicality of the world that we can perceive. And, and so we understand that we are at a level of language uh, that the world is talking, is telling us, talking to us with uh, another kind of words. So when you talk about, when, when you mention Democritus uh, saying, talking about the atoms, so I, th I think it's totally fantastic. How this came to the mind to somebody who were not able to see that, we are still not able to see them because sure. it's a complete, what we see are pure representation that are pure jokes as well. And, and it's really interesting because we consider this as a truth, but we know also that beyond the atoms, there are, there are neutrons and uh, uh, electrons, and, and beyond that, there are quarks, and beyond that, there are some other subparticles. Um, and, and I'm sure there is no reason we find any limit in the subdivision of the uh, impossible to subdivide atom. And, and so uh, for me, uh, there is something related to the idea of discretization of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that we could divide everything into infinite particles that our brain could, could handle, could uh, treat like a language. And, and so it's a pure human vision of the world that we have and we are experiencing. And we don't have to complain about that. You know, there is no colonization, intellectual colonization of the world. We should, we should feel guilty of. Uh, this is just uh, uh, how uh, living beings understand what's around them. And, uh, and they understand that according to their capacity of uh, observe or think things. And uh, so I, I'm going totally in your direction for that because uh, I, uh, I consider this is, a, this is a key. As soon as we understand that we are trying to uh, reduce the world to something we can compute mentally uh, with natural brain or artificial brains, uh, we, uh, uh, we don't understand what's going on. I think that's great. I am uh, going to pick up one of the words you said. We don't need to feel guilty. You're absolutely right. We don't need to feel guilty. We need to be careful because our fact of not per perceiving the danger or not really understanding the danger that uh, humanity itself is in incurring right now with the, uh, uh, the climate change, which is really happening. We can't go on denying it. Uh, and absolutely, it's a murderous situation too, because a lot of greed supports that uh, 
situation globally. Uh, but the, one of the major figures of the Western cultures is guilt. Guilt arrives when you have a inside, when you have a person, when you are responsible for that person yourself. When that self becomes very, very predominant in your life, when you suddenly realize how much yourself actually <laughs> counts, you become responsible for its destiny. And the Greeks invented destiny. They invented destiny with uh, the, the three goddesses of life and death, uh, you know, uh, Cloto pulling the wire, Lachesis, you know, me uh, measuring it. It was always already a great symbol of measurement. And then Atropos cutting it. That is suddenly your destiny becomes your responsibility. What was your responsibility in a community oriented society? The other, the people. The, it's, it's very powerful. The, 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 the Jews reflect, rejected their own Christ, but Christ was the first personal God. He was the son of Yahweh, we assume. Yahweh was not a personal God. Yahweh was a God of the people. Yahweh actually, it was so much so that the story of Sodom and Gomorrah fascinates me too. I mean, you need to find eight men who will represent, it's like the chorus of the Greek tragedy. You have eight men who are just, if you can't find eight men, I will destroy the cities. It's fascinating because it is the shift from a collective group, community oriented responsibility, the, the culture of shame, to the personal integration of responsibility. Suddenly you're responsible to yourself. That doesn't mean you stop being responsible to the other, but that the balance between the two shifts. Now, what happens today? Today, and this is where quantum physics again becomes really critical. Today, you are responsible to the whole thing. And, you're, and the corresponding you know, unpleasant sensation, I mean, you've, shame is an unpleasant sensation. Guilt is an unpleasant sensation. Anxiety is an unpleasant sensation. We have different kind of disagio, as they say in Italian, the, the, the unpleasant, unpleasant sensation, that's what it is. So it's, it's, a very, it's very important to recognize that we also develop our ethics on the basis of what you were saying before. We, we can't help it. We couldn't help being colonizer, uh, and now we're overdoing it in the other direction. Uh, we couldn't help, you know, treating other cultures or treating women versus men. We could actually help it. Simple humanity and sort of care of one species member to another species, as other members of the same species should have told us more. But the fact is, there is a real question of attribution of guilt. And I think that what's going on in the revision of history is also going the wrong way. We should, we should not look to the past. We should look to the future and do better. That's what we should, that should be what we should do. Don't, don't you think that the concept of redemption uh, related to the crisis, uh, the concept of redemption yeah. that means we are born guilty. Uh, that in Western culture, there is something which is weird uh, mm -hmm. because it's totally related to the fact that we, we just have to, to buy uh, our, uh, our path or our way to redemption uh, and, and to survive to that, to, to, to all the guilt we have to, to deal with. I actually, uh, I, I don't like guilt at all. Not because yeah, I'm... yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I'm just talking, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not talking about something I believe in, yeah. I'm talking about something which is part of a culture where uh, if you develop the concept uh, of guilt, uh, you control better the people. Well, of course, that's, that's, that, why that's the best way. Work. So you, you tell them you're guilty, uh, in, in all uh, in all monotheist religions, there yeah. are different ways to consider this. Uh, probably uh, in Christianism, uh, and and is a Muslim in Islam. Uh, that there is there is this idea that uh, actually you are, you you're born guilty. You have to you have to improve yourself. 
in, in order to get your pass to a better condition and either to get the 72 who is or, or your place to paradise or whatever. And, and that, that's interesting uh, because you, you can imagine very easily how this can support uh, the idea of control and power. Uh, because if you're guilty, sorry, but you cannot talk. Uh, I'm going to tell you what you should do. No, we, we can. But I mean, uh, I'll get back to it because social credits in China, which is addressed to a culture that is much more communitarian than the, than the individualist culture of the West, is a replacement. There's no need for guilt anymore, nor for shame. Well, maybe for shame, there's still place. But guilt, there's no need for guilt because you don't decide. You are, you are totally teleguided by us. Oh, that's difficult to say because uh, uh, the, the social credit is trying to measure how guilty you are. No, this it, is what it is it about. It. <laughs> measuring, measuring your guilt and, and yeah. telling you, I'm sorry, you lost. Yeah, yeah, you, this game is not for you. And if you want to improve your ranking, uh, you have to do so much to not not to to be better, but to conform to to uh, comply yeah. with the regulations. Well, and, well, and so that this is very this is a very serious thing. Uh, I totally agree. But you you have no idea how people take it. The the gamification of uh, of control of consent has become so strong so efficient that we uh, in Hong Kong, we, we uh, see things that, wow, you wouldn't imagine that even three months ago, six months ago. Oh, really? Uh, now now there, there are questionnaires where students are supposed to say how much they love the flag, the Chinese flag. <laughs> how much they believe that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, China is, uh, is the best coast and the best country, and so on. and so. This is uh, this is something they have to they have to fill the form and check boxes. And if they don't check boxes properly, uh, I'm not sure they get a very good social credit. If I uh, we'll get we'll get back <laughs> we'll get back to social credits. I think we should move on because we do have a bit more to to go through. But I will get yeah, back. Yeah, to I'm sorry. I'm sorry, no, we are not talking great. about it, that. It, it is the whole and, and I, I never said what I said, and then this will be removed from the final editing. Okay, so um, what I'm saying here is that language becomes, um, uh, marries electricity on the telegraph cable. And of course, that's the figures of the grounds of McLuhan, telegraph, radio, telephone, uh, television. Marshall talked about computers, but it was the last chapter of understanding media. He made a few predictions about what would happen with them, but he had no idea about internet as such uh, or about how, how it would change people. And it's too bad that we are missing him because he was much cleverer than I am. I, you know, I don't pretend to have anything like what he thought, but it is something we really need. Somebody who can really see the way he saw it as you know, maybe see five, 50 or 60 years ahead. Um, what are the key? Well, some of them, there's, they're, they're not all there, but the internet from ARPANET to, to, to 5G, and I, you'll, you'd think that 5G is just one more after 4G and 3G and so on. Actually, it's, it's more threatening than that or more invasive than that. Artificial intelligence from uh, being abandoned in the late 80s to being, you know, uh, invoked everywhere and all the time, all the way to GPT-3. I'll give you a few examples of that. They are pretty stunning. Uh, the digital twin, which is the form that, the frame that, you know, coming to Goffman here, it's the, the new frame that is ejected from the, from the inside of the person. Suddenly your source of decision is becoming, it's not there yet, it's pretty close though, uh, is becoming uh, the, the, your guide and your, your interpret of the uh, in, infosphere. And of course, the social credits we just, we just talked about. And all of them together uh, make uh, time, space, and self fuse. They come, to, they come in a single digital reign. 
And that's something that is, uh, again, uh, very interesting. The, the way we are sort of caught in the system of the digitization. Uh, a typical uh, field, uh, you know, in design, uh, virtual reality, the digital twins are there again, uh, artificial intelligence, intelligent materials, uh, autonomous systems, um, distribution, automated distribution and uh, all sort of things, connectivity, softwareization of products, uh, cloud computing platforms. And I just wanted to just show you the bunch of it. Uh, wherever, ever, everywhere you look now, you are going to see a figure of the digital culture. And of course the time we spend with it. I, have, I must have spent about seven or six hours on this uh, uh, screen just today. Not because only because of this talk, but because I had another webinar which I also had to prepare and which I also had to share it. So it's uh, you know it we live with the thing and it lives with us and it turns us into something different. Um, so uh, what I see as as uh, the role of five G is that it is doing that sort of integration. Five five G is that core. Already, internet itself was an integrating substance, but 5G pushes that to extreme. Um, the, 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 I would say the purpose and the destiny of the digital transformation is not to just help business do things better, which is what usually people think about when they talk about digital transformation. It is the total integration. It is what McLuhan did predict, not from digitization, which he didn't predict, but of the effect of electricity. And this is a very interesting question to ask oneself, and I can't give it a final answer, but what is more important as a ground? Is it electricity which allows digitization or is it just digitization? Can you separate digitization from electricity? I don't think one can, but I've had people discuss that with me and not agreeing with me. So anyway, I open the question. Uh, it implies reforming space and time and self, among other things. It's an integrator. 5G is an integrator. Uh, it goes way further than uh, near field communication as a complete environment. Um, uh, data and communication in absolute real time. It's an extremely fast system. Uh, I know that, you know, <laughs> part of the fake news and the crazy world we're in now is that people bring down towers of 5G because they think it, it produces... Uh, uh, coronavirus in them. I mean, you know, I've read a, so much nonsense in the last year. That is a, beyond, the, beyond the pale. Um, and then it has a very short waves, and that's why you have so many cells. You have to have cells every 100 meters or so. Um, and so it's very expensive, and, but, it, but you can't stop it because it is extraordinarily powerful, the things that people need to do. So it also has different layers of distribution so that you don't mix everything into single, uh, uh, I would say, uh, band. You have several bandwidths within 5G that can be specialized for specific uh, purposes. So that's, uh, and it mixes uh, IoT and big data uh, with all the algorithms. Um, it also changes space. Now, I think that not just 5G changes space by turning the whole environmental of environment of information into a single environment. That itself is a change of space. But I also mean it because um, we live in three different principal spaces. The physical space that uh, we share, the this uh, digital space that we share, the physical space that we you know, learn to live in, and then of course uh, the mental space. And these are totally integrated by the new technologies. Uh, so much so that, of course, the mind can be penetrated by the new technologies. So that's something which is important to keep in mind that while when we go swimming, it's yet another kind of a space. When we change of country, it's another space. But these are not structural spaces, whereas this, these three are structural and they're close enough. Mm -hmm. So they put the body as a subject of instantaneous communication without process. Um, everything works in duplex, you receive, but you give as you receive, so that the, you know, there is no more separation in terms of the dialogic uh, way of, of dealing with the environment, connected to it completely uh, with the physical, mental, and digital. It's, a, it's a, what I call a perfect symbiosis. Um, re reforming time, uh, it can capture and, uh, and, and follow all your movements and uh, I call, I talk about the digital unconscious here. It is, it's distributed on the basis of, in, in several 
databases. What I call the digital unconscious is everything that's known about you that you don't know or that you don't have access to. And that is known by a, a bunch of people, companies, governments that take advantage of that knowledge. And, uh, and, and, and I, I put together the digital unconscious along with the uh, digital twin, because the digital twin is the re recuperation, the reappropriation of all that data about you that constitute your life, your personality, your skills, your, even, even your thoughts. There is a, there's work now done, on, on, as I said before, of analyzing what people are thinking in order to make it a database. So yes, we have been in a transition period where the digital unconscious as in the social dilemma has been ruling our lives, but we are also defending ourselves and we have to know exactly how we can negotiate the difference between uh, yesterday and tomorrow, how we can negotiate our being in that, in, in that environment. Um, this is uh, the life log, the idea of a life log that you can actually register everything that you do all the time, everywhere. Uh, my colleague at the University of Toronto, Steve Mann, was the first to actually point that out by living with the camera and then sleeping with it uh, and registering every moment of his life. And he was doing that in order to just become digital. And he, was, he, was, he became very famous because of that. Then he had a lot of trouble trying to go through, you know, in airports through the uh, security places. They ruined his material. He was extremely angry. There was a whole Foo for all about that in Toronto when he came back. Canadians are very picky at airports. And so it, it, things were difficult. But the point is, and I have a student, ex student of mine who is developing a company where he can now already uh, use uh, something like what's called vitrionics, the little cameras that you put in contact lenses that actually film from your point of view. And you can also uh, record your own voice. From bone, from bone conduction so that the reality of your experience is not a shock, like always having to have yourself as an objective vision, the, the man in the forest or the person in the forest, but a subjective one as well, including hearing your own voice the way you hear it, because hearing your voice air conducted is always a very big disappointment. <laughs> so you have all kinds of ways by which you can really be recorded, and then your digital twin becomes very useful to a doctor. Uh, you can make decisions about uh, careers, about that, who you might marry. There's a lot of things that we can get out of our digital twin. Anyway, um, McLuhan said, uh, we will be able to record every moment of our life and reproduce it for study and entertainment. I have never found where that was, but I didn't invent it. It's supposed to be in 1973. I haven't found it yet. I'm still looking for where he said that, but I think it's a great idea. And it's so McLuhan. That's already some, it's, it's the way he would write it. Yeah. But I, for study and entertainment, the typical case. So, so life logging does is, is around. Okay, so here now I have, um, I'm, I'm, I'm onto the digital twin and it was first, uh, I don't know if you saw it, if you, anyone saw this? It's kind of, it's kind of amazing. I, let me just skip the ad. Okay, skip the ad, there we go. And enlarge it. It's called the Knowledge Navigator. I know you've seen it, Maurice. A very bad prince, but that's all you all you got. So this professor is coming back in his office and opens his iPad. 1987, I remember. 1987. Your graduate research team in Guatemala, just checking in. Robert Jordan, a second semester junior, requesting a second extension on his term paper. And your mother reminding you about your father's surprise birthday party next Sunday. Today, you have a faculty lunch at 12 o'clock. You need to take Kathy to the airport by 2. You have a lecture at 4.15 on deforestation in the Amazon rainforest. Right. 
Let me see the lecture notes from last semester. No, that's not enough. I need to review more recent literature. Pull up all the new articles I haven't read yet. Journal articles only? Mm -hmm, fine. Your friend Jill Gilbert has published an article about deforestation in the Amazon and its effects on rainfall in the Sub-Sahara. It also covers drought's effect on food production in Africa and increasing imports of food. Contact Jill. I'm sorry, she's not available right now. I left a message that you had called. Okay, let's see. There's an article about five years ago, Dr. Flemson or something. He really disagreed with the direction of Jill's research. John Fleming of Uppsala University. He published in the Journal of Earth Science of July 20 of 2006. Yes, that's it. He was challenging Jill's projection of the amount of carbon dioxide being released to the atmosphere through deforestation. I'd like to recheck his figures. Here is the rate of deforestation he predicted. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Hmm. He was really off. Give me the university research network. Show only universities with geography nodes. You sort of got the message. So Brazil. I, I won't keep this going for, I would have liked the, the video conferencing Copy the arriving in 1987 as well. At one month intervals. Excuse me. Jill Gilbert is calling yeah. back. Great. Put her through. Hi, Mike. What's up? Jill, thanks for getting back to me. Well, I guess that new grant of yours hasn't dampened your literary so, abilities. Rumor the rest is a little bit, you know, more of the same, I would say. So, uh, article on deforestation. Uh -huh. just get rid of it. And go back to where we were before. Wait, 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 wait. My is this one of your typical last minute panic? Okay, there we are. Um, so, yes, um, the Navigator it is a very predictive uh, little video, which was created by uh, uh, Scully, who was the pre president of Apple. It was not done by Steve Jobs. But what I like about it is it really it, it presents all the capabilities that we have now, speaking to the computer, speaking to people through the computer, collecting information and analyzing that information, uh, having this very natural relationship also with the system, the, the, the talking of the professor talking to his assistant is uh, very natural and so on. And, and we're getting there too. I am surprised every time uh, by the ease by which I can simply talk to my watch to look for something in Wikipedia. Or um, it's uh, quite astounding. So there's a fluidity of relationship that we have with our new figures. Um, and of course, we have, we have a, a Google Assistant and Siri and Alexa. And then that leads naturally, so, uh, according to me, to the digital twin. The big difference, of course, is that Alexa is working for Jeff Bezos. And, uh, and Alexa comes from uh, cyberspace to your house instead of your digital twins comes from your house to cyberspace. And I see the digital twin as the interpreter of your needs, your interests, your uh, uh, research and, va and various things, just like we saw in cyberspace, because we don't have, as people using things like my MacBook here, the same ease and flexibility of dealing with that world that we need. It's so huge. We don't have in our heads uh, uh, data analytics that can use all the IoT and all the big data that's available for the specific area of research that we have. We don't have this. And yet, if we had a digital twin that was actually into the, into the cyberspace, it'd be working there for us. Now, one thing you need to know, and this is a good surprise, and it's probably good news, is that you already have a digital twin in your cell phone. You have in your cell phone activities, plans, um, records of your, you know, sports and gymnastics and so on, uh, your research. Uh, you have everything there. It's not integrated into a single entity. You may not need that, may not want that, but if you want to know how a digital twin would work, uh, it, there is already enough integrating system 
straight from the digital twins of machines, because of course a digital twin of humans is an entirely different story than a digital twin of a machine, but a digital twin of machine has an integrating function so that the machine is always knowing every aspect of itself. And so that the idea of having the same thing just from the information that you have from your cell phone would already be a very useful tool and something that would not take a tremendous amount of programming or genius to accomplish. I am actually very surprised it's not done yet. So there we are, that's the, the whole idea of digital twin. Now, of course, that's what I am, a uh, bit of my theory here is that the digital twin is going to take the place of our ego out there in cyberspace. They represent the externalization as you have obviously uh, considered before is that uh, your memory is disappearing from your the inside of your, the contents of your memory is disappearing from inside your head because you delegate the whole thing to your cell phone, right? You, a lot of stuff you don't have time to think about or things you don't want to remember, including phone numbers of your closest person. Uh, it's all going into your cell phone, so that's one thing. Your uh, Alexa and uh, Siri are pretty well making decisions for you. They don't do it yet, although I heard the other day of somebody complaining that Alexa was actually calling the person, hey, listen to me. <laughs> Imagine Alexa actually ordering you around. Well, it's on their way. The point is, um, this is what this is it, that they, 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 they the self is the last thing to get out of our body, but it's going there. So they can, uh, they, are, they, they, they can become the origin of our decision and they can resolve the complexity connecting us to a new registry, a new, a new, a new environment. And so, I mean, this is what they, they, once they are there, they could decide for us. And there is also, as I say this for individuals, I also see this for institutions, institutions, government, uh, education systems, uh, legal systems, uh, medical institutions, use more and more of these information coming from algorithms and from data analytics. So that this is a bit what I was saying before about the disappearance of guilt. I understand very well what uh, what Maurice has actually objected to that uh, specific, specifically about uh, social credits, but because it's true, it's, there is guilt involved there up to a point. But fundamentally, if you have a very smooth system, organized a symbiotic system that takes care of the environment and or the most of your decision, suddenly you don't take decisions anymore. And you have actually yielded all that to your uh, to to your to, to your environment of alg algorithmic environment. This is the kind of I love this image, but I won't analyze it. But it's the kind of quantity of data that Alexa uses to make decisions for you, uh, and this is the kind of processing that Alexa does. And again, I found that the beautiful design, and I don't want to go into it. I am not a programmer, and so you can just enjoy yourself by looking at it. But that's definitely an aspect of the question. The extreme complexity and quantity of parameters that are uh, available for finding out more and more about us. This is the big deal. I don't know how many of you have tried it. How many have seen it? I have been very lucky that uh, two days ago, I was with a friend in Rome who exceptionally was allowed to use, was given access to GPT-3. Now, many people in the world have access to GPT-2 uh, but GPT-3 is another thing altogether. The difference is uh, uh, 100 and uh, 100, 100 uh, billion parameters, 100 billion parameters. And uh, GPT-2 is pretty powerful, but it's incredible what this can do. Um, it's the, what I call it the intermediate zone between inter, uh, artificial intelligence and general artificial intelligence. It's the one that's closest to the human, the human mind. But I also see it as somehow the invitation for what's called the super, superposition principle in quantum physics, the possibility of quantum computers being able to multiply the quantity of operation they can do at the same time by simply using different position of the same, of the same uh, particle. The particle becoming, uh, instead of being one, zero, is one, more than one, still more than one, 
still <laughs> less than zero <laughs> and so on. So if all these variation, and today these uh, qubits, as they're called, are put together precisely because of the power of doing, and already some extraordinarily difficult calculation have been successfully done by the very limited quantum computing we have. So I see GPT-3 as something that is intermediate. It's like, it's like a transition between digital culture and, uh, and, and, the, uh, and the quantum culture. So generative pre-trained transformer is a model of uh, auto auto-regressing language that utilizes um, deep learning, but also can be trained without supervision, which is saving an enormous amount of time. The whole problem when you train intelligence, artificial intelligence, is that it takes a lot of inputting. As you, in the old days when people were using neuromimetic systems, uh, like for example, a bank could decide to give you a, a loan for buying a house or whatever, after studying all the, it could know about you and Put inputting that in a simulation of, an, of, a, of a machine learning. It was early machine learning. The amount of time you had to have something like 100,000 experiences of the same array of information to finally come with something that was reliable. And you could give money to this person or not to this other one. Um, with this system, you can actually, the system is so clever that it can learn without being corrected, not for everything, but for a good third, so that you could reach easily 175 billion parameters to, to actually feed it. The other thing is that it's agnostic, it's task agnostic. That means that it'll do all kinds of things which are not part of the same type of software. It can uh, write software for you. It can write a story. I'll show you, I'll show you what, here are, here are the things that it can do can write an email for you. Well, that's simple. It can create Google answers. It's, again, not that. It, it can start designing things for you. You just, and it does it not, your computer will design things for you if you give it all the parameters that you want the design to be like, this, the material you're, this, you're, you're thinking about. No, in, in the, the beauty of GPT-3 is that you can put just five or six words and have a poem that actually makes sense written for you or a story. It can make jokes. You want a joke about an elephant. <laughs> That's not difficult, but it'll give you a joke about an elephant. You want to have a joke about an elephant in a car. It'll probably tell you an old saw, the story of how to put three elephants in the front and three in the back. <laughs> it will do that, but it'll also invent entirely new uh, jokes. So it can do accounting, can do program for you. Um, it can do a presentation. Let's click on this and see if it works. This is pretty, pretty, pretty strong. Okay, so that's the team. Strategies for learning to code in Japan. So I'm gonna make it bigger. They achieve practical software development skills, a metaphor for how useful programming ability can be for starters. How to achieve productivity quickly. This is written Nobody by the code. Nobody figures out how to code perfectly the first time. It's mostly luck. Learn just the right and the choice skills of images too. in the and right comparisons. order. Avoid perfectionism, not doing something is sometimes the best way to learn something. All problems are pretty much the same. The best way to solve them is usually so simple that a monkey could do it. Let's I get like started to not then. Learn Just like a monkey makes big castles huh? with an hourglass. All our I like time the, not to learn things. something is the Let's best way to do it. <laughs> Software development is actually a bunch of often complicated problems. But that's not a big deal, is it? So this is Looking a smart right? is the social I should have asked the GPT-3 when I all the developers feel the pressure, <laughs> for whatever reason, to have the look of the component coder, most likely due to peer pressure. If you don't need your code to run during actual product development, stuff it in a module in a separate directory. If you don't regularly turn code into poetry, you probably aren't a good programmer. If you've written 500 lines of code and have an actual working program that doesn't crash, sprint to the finish line. A happy ending to all of our code. So you built a program and work in like 10 minutes. All your code was beautiful. Why you should always code like it's your last day on earth. If you always think like it's the last day on earth, your last day coding, it'll push you just enough to get you to finish whatever you might need to finish. So now that you know it's impossible to not learn the code, 
go write something, anything. And when you finally do finish this nice feature, you should always make sure you drink the required amount of alcohol. But don't drink too much alcohol. <laughs> like me. It's really so great. It's completely crazy. But it is completely okay. done by, without corrections too, by the system. And so uh, and I have found that the system is quite humorous. And I have a feeling it's Elon Musk. Elon Musk is paying for it, at least for most of the actual programming. Uh, and I think he's probably the one who, who wants to have the, uh, the humor step in. I'll show you an example of what I did with it. And uh, you will see it. it's very humorous as well. Anyway, as you can see, you can make an app on the weather that corresponds to your area. Uh, you can do programming. Uh, you can use Excel automatically, things that I would be very happy to have available. I'm not good at Excel. You can do uh, transactions, like send money to your wife's account and, and, and so on. You can uh, more here. It's, it's like HAL in 2001. It analyzes content, context as well. I'm not showing you much because of time. You know, we're already an hour and a half in this. So, But um, it can generate images, can make music. Uh, it can suggest ideas for business. I forgot that that was pretty good. Pretty good. Some silly and some very good ones. So let's just see. Okay, so um, I fed Baskin business list to GPT-3 and it came up with some new project ideas. I paste some here. Tent starter, allow investors to fund full-time homesteading with the tent itself serving as a final financial instrument. Not quite sure I understand that. Slinky trampoline, an amplified trampoline that features machine-driven magnetic movements, allowing users to jump higher. <laughs> okay, there's more humor there than a real business proposition. Um, it's a, a really good landing page software that automatically optimizes landing pages for conversion. Uh, trees as people, literal street trees make, made out of people. Logo shark, a logo shark wallpaper for your office, a shark that knows everything about your company. <laughs> I mean, okay, uh, I'll spare you. But it's, again, it's, for the moment it's used in a very silly fashion, but it is going to become very, very much more developed. I can see that. And it'll do a lot of things. The, the, the interesting thing is that we know about storing data, information, we know about retrieving it in different ways so that it produces new things. You do, we, we can analyze. But what we haven't done before is what EP3 is doing. It is actually act creating stuff out of nowhere. I have read uh, two or three poems, and I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have them here, um, that were uh, imitated from Edgar Allan Poe. And it was stunning. One of them, not all, not the three, they were not, they were not perfect. And it isn't perfect. That's one of the things. But one of them was so good, you would have thought it was Poe. So it can do a lot of stuff that, uh, that there's the humor and satire is wonderful, but it's all in, in English and I you know, couldn't really translate it and so on. But as I said, you can have this and you can do it yourself and you can play with it and I, you will have fun. There's no doubt about it. Um, so, yeah, the point is, of course, and here we are going to get into some kind of discussion around this uh, critical time we are living now, which I call the epistemological crisis. Um, whatever product or innovation creates uh, environments of services and also of disservice that reconfigure the, the human attitude. And it's around these service or disservice uh, that uh, we are these environment of service and this are uh, forever invisible until a new environment has substituted. And this is the whole idea of the environment and counter environment that you had a chance to listen, uh, Andrew uh, McLuhan on. He, he made a very good, very good development on that. So what is our disservice? Well, it's the, the datacracy we were talking about, uh, this analysis of everyone's move, uh, a system of social credit now, of course, we have somebody who lives in China right now. And, and of course, uh, Maurice, when I think about you living in China, I think you are living in Hong Kong. But And I thought Hong Kong is not China, but Hong Kong is becoming China and under duress, under duress as well. So all of here, you have all the criteria that you would have normally for anybody's portfolio. Uh, but with things like circle of friends, I know that two years ago, uh, already two years ago, uh, some people, 
about 1 million and 700,000 Chinese people were not allowed to go on trains and planes at certain times, not only because their credit, social credit total wasn't sufficient, but also if it was sufficient, but because they had too many friends who had a low creditation. Now that's pushing it. You know, you, this is really shows the community as opposed to the single person. The single person is actually maybe the good apple in a bag, in a bag, bad, uh, you know, basket. So it's, so here, so, so there's a whole kind of funneling system where you have all these criteria and you do it for individuals and you do it for companies on the right. And so, uh, and then you have the possibility if you are a good boy to send your children to the right school, buy in the, a house in the right area, uh, marry the right person and all kinds of things like that. Uh, if not, well, no, you are punished. And there are lots of stories already about this. What the, but the biggest stunning thing is why would the Chinese people accept this? Uh, the quick and short answer is they don't have a choice. Yes, that's true, they don't have a choice. But the fact is there's is also something else. And this is where I'm responding to what we were talking about with Maurice before. Up until 20 years ago, according to a Chinese sociologist who is in Beijing, um, it was considered very bad manners to hold a secret. In other words, you could not have a secret in Chinese in a proper Chinese society. It was it was just bad. People did not hide anything. So that the idea that you are followed by cameras in the streets and that your cell phone is being <laughs> analyzed for whatever it contains, your digital twin in perspective, this is something this is something that's taken for granted by many people. Now I would like to hear Maurice on that because I am not entirely sure that that's a correct estimation. I think that even, you know, I have Chinese students who come to the, uh, the Polytechnic Institute of Milan where I teach a course. And I also am dealing with Chinese people. Uh, we had a wonderful series of conference with Maurice last year at the uh, Chinese Academy of Fine Arts. Uh, so it, there are areas that I don't dare to push either in Milan or in uh, China, the questions, how do they feel about it? And this is maybe a good point for you to answer that on uh, this case. <laughs> yeah, I, I may try, but I, I'm not sure I have uh, a kind of um, uh, accurate uh, perception as uh, uh, Hong Kong is still something uh, a little beside of uh, Chinese culture, mm. uh, but um, yeah, yeah, you, you know, there is a, there is a big uh, there is a big shift back to Confucianism, and uh, where the culture of hierarchy and respect of rules and respect of institutions are considered as uh, major. Uh, major qualities and uh, and uh, and values, and, and this is what uh, people follow. So uh, I guess uh, just uh, transparency, privacy, for example, is not considered as a priority. Mm -hmm. the, now, what make it more complex because the new generation have not been uh, have not didn't grow in an environment may, uh, uh, working on this, uh, um, uh, that grown on this model, so that they, um, they have other motivations and the motivation is a so-called gamification of consent. And, and so, you know, what you don't have by your past culture, because you, would have forgotten what Confucianism is about, what uh, Xi Jinping really loves because it's fantastic. She wants to preserve society. Uh, sure. That's uh, a perfect thing. Uh, there is a new argument which is, uh, but you can win or lose. Yeah. And, and it's all about that. The gamification is okay. whatever you do, you're gonna win the game or lose the game. And, and for the new generation that uh, don't really, uh, are not close to the traditional Chinese culture, 
this is very valuable. They really appreciate that because uh, the, you know the compromise with uh, uh, with the kind of uh, capitalistic model of success, making money and so on. Uh, this is uh, at the origin. It's not really close to the uh, traditional Chinese culture for those now who are in charge, but mm -hmm. uh, they define substitutes. Okay, I don't know if I really no, revise. Thank, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, this is a plan here of the total social control uh, all the way to 2020. You can again study that carefully by yourselves. Um, and here's a game. This is a Sesame Credit game, which is in Chinese, you can see. And this has the added advantage or disadvantage that you can be judged by your peers, your family, uh, your cousins, and so on. It's, it's, it gets right into under the skin, I would say. So the, the gamification is a very powerful theme, and I'm glad that you pointed it out because I wasn't going to present this as a game, even though it is. But now I see what you're saying, and maybe that's why it catches on, because I don't know how much people would do this in my circles <laughs> or in Paris or in Naples or so on. I think it would be very, very different. We're, we're in the world of omerta here, so <laughs> have to be very careful. Um, and of course, you all saw Black Mirror's Nosedive, where this poor woman's life is entirely destroyed by the rating of herself by her friends and by the people she runs into. Uh, and again, as Black Mirror is very close to the future, it's actually very close to the present uh, in its estimation and judgment of what's happening. So I just thought I should show this to you. Now, uh, again, the whole question of the uh, surroundings and the, the environment and, and counter environment. And what, what Cluan says here is very pertinent about the fact that when two environments get together or run into each other, uh, they actually change each other very much. And they do so sometimes in extremely complicated ways in innumerable series of problems and confusions. So here are a few. I'm talking about the epistemological crisis of the encounter between the uh, uh, digital transformation and our literate past. So what we owe? We owe to the alphabetization a major control over language, a personal major control over language, a private consciousness, a sentiment of autodetermination, sometimes illusory, but very often uh, uh, mostly taken for granted. But above everything, we owe what I've described before, the distinction between the objective and the subjective. What the, transform the digital transformation is removing, going head on against the literate, trans the literate uh, culture is privacy in all its forms. Uh, the autonomy substituted by heteronomy. I mean, uh, uh, social credits is definitely a heteronomy kind of uh, um, attack on the autonomy. It's other, it's other people making the rules for you and enforcing those rules on a permanent basis. The responsibility uh, is substituted by you know, security and social control, and democracy is substituted in by, by datacracy. So that uh, the, the factors that are convergent on the crisis is the pandemi pandemia, which has led to infodemia, and certainly we know that, uh, the whole discourse on post-truth. Uh, I talk about, uh, I compare the situation to the famous uh, triangle of the sign, which was derived from Saussure's, Ferdinand de Saussure's course uh, to his students. He never wrote anything about it, but his students took down his notes and they, they created the famous triangle of the sign. And the triangle of the sign consists in the signi signifier, which is whatever object you see, written or you know, shape or, or whatever you hear, word that you hear, and the signifier, the signifier is what, it, what happens in your head when you hear or see this thing. And those two things are a strong relationship of meaning. They create meaning, but they are not sufficient in and of themselves. They need what's called a referent. And the referent is something in the world that says that what you have just heard and thought of is actually something that exists. Uh, you, let's say a road sign which says no parking. So you see the no parking, you know 
that you are driving, but you know you can't park there, so you've got the message. But you also know that if you park there, there's a big chance that a policeman will go by and put you and give you a, uh, a you know, a, a multa, whatever you call that, uh, uh, a ticket. In Canada, it's called a ticket. Uh, well, that's a kind of a problem because <laughs> the reference is very st stronger than anything else. You're not going to park there, and that's it. But uh, with Trump discourses, Donald Trump's discourse, all you needed was a signifier, and he had a lot of those, and a signifier that people actually believed. And, uh, and that was it. Uh, there was no reference. And in fact, there never is a reference in fake news. Or the fake news makes, uh, they, they make uh, allusion to the wrong reference because they're fake. So the whole problem of not having any more the need to verify what things are being said and what you are learning um, arrives to the absurd, the total absurdity. For example, the allegation of QAnon during the reign of Trump. It's, you know, we've, we've gone through the return of the absurdism of the, you know, the, the kind of Ionesco and, and uh, Beckett style of his request. We, we're a very absurd world. So this is something, and, and, and we, we don't know whether we we'll recover the reference. And in fact, that's another thing that uh, some of the, the better thinkers of the quantum physics are saying that the world of reference creates the subjectivity objectivity difference that we want to overcome. We better have something good to replace it because so far it has worked very well. So that, that's the whole idea is that um, the evacuation of objectivity and uh, uh, creates, a, creates a real uh, real problem. Um, Delma, I have a crisis here um, because it's, uh, it's almost two hours and I think uh, people are probably terribly uh, tired. So maybe we won't have a question. And yeah. <laughs> uh, huh? No, I'm just gonna go great. through. Yeah. It's 1 p.m. <laughs> yes, you are, yeah, it's 1 p.m. 1 a.m., sorry. <laughs> should, should we put uh, uh, the quantum physics to a next lecture, or do you want to have a quick run through it? Uh, Delma, you're, you. the, you're the guide here. Delma. It's, it's a very good challenge. Uh, I think that is uh, another, another part of, of the discussion. It is. It is. But, I think uh, I, we, you, we you can, can sum up it. this yeah. this uh, part to introduce, and then we can generate yes. another talk or discussion or even a, a panel with you regarding that's right. okay. That's how a good is the the possibility to, to the quantum physics to okay. rescue. I'll show you, the, uh, these are some of the aspects of it. This is the first photograph that was taken of the uh, entanglement, two particles that are entangled. Uh, this is the pictures that are made by in quantum ways. This is a quantum computer, which has 54 or 56 qubits. Uh, these are the qubits here. Um, so it shows you that technology is really going there, okay? Um, here are some of the figures and the principles of quantum physics. So it is the ultimate, it's the deepest way that we know to get. Uh, Maurice quite, uh, said before that uh, uh, it's probably impossible to arrive at, at the rock bottom of anything, and he's probably right, but at least this is as far as we've got, and it is very different from what we had before. So that's why it's worth studying. What are the figures? Computation, uh, sensors, cryptography, simulations, metrology, how to measure you, the, the, the quantum uh, uh, cesium clock that actually measures to a difference of one second from uh, something like five billion years ago. I mean, it's really amazing. So it's done with, with quantum. Uh, also, uh, the improvement of GPS is done with quantum relationships. So it, it just, there are real, and cryptography, uh, imaging quantum M MRI actually as based on quantum as well. So the technology is really there, but it's there very much hidden so far. When it gets out into the open, such as having computers and so on, it becomes much more serious. Um, the field is everything I've just said, and not everything is in evidence. But as I said, we are now at the level where we comparable to where we were in the 90s about digital culture. And the principles, are incertitude, the uncertain, not incertitude, uncertainty. What does that mean? And uh, 
we would need a long time, a lot of time to do uh, justice to that. But uncertainty was Heisenberg's proposal to recognize the impossibility of of knowing ahead of time where a particle would be at any one time as a, as the same time as knowing its movement because particle was moving but you couldn't know its position and its movement simultaneously and there are several experiments that prove this and so that's a principle of uncertainty but it's extended to the uncertainty of anything in other words in order for things to if we have a thing that's all the time changing not only that does that produces a natural form of uncertainty, but it is also based on the uncertainty as a structural element of physics, not simply as an effect on people who don't understand the whole thing. So that's really important. Superposition, I talked about it a little bit today, uh, again. Uh, a temporality, a spatiality, these things are important. Entanglement is one of the most important one. Non-locality, all of these things deserve their own Thing I'm going to, I will conclude with this because this is what I asked GPT-3 two days ago when I had a chance to try it. I said to my friend ba Paolo, uh, let me write the sentences. And, I, and my sentences were um, nothing, oh, sorry, that they're in red. Uh, the qu qu quantum physics have changed uh, and is the new ground of culture. It has transformed education, politics, and business. Uh, today, everything and everybody is integrated or entangled. And then the answer uh, was presented like this. I, I didn't change anything. La era quantica. There was a title, the, the, quantic, quantic, uh, the quantum age. Nothing will remain unchanged. All the implications are, are, are beginning to uh, emerge. Um, the, the, sh the way we live, the way we work, the way we learn, the way we play is, um, is, is, is experiencing a, a deep change, is experiencing a very deep change that transforms everything and all the aspects of our lives. It is a fundamental change in the shape of life uh, and our, you know, the way we deal with the world. Uh, the mediation and manipulation of the subatomic particles has uh, uh, turned in, so sophisticated, have become so sophisticated that today we can go way beyond uh, what we have done before. We can explore what's possible, what we imagine, and even what's not possible. It's not only a question of a new era, it's the quantum age. The quantum age is, and this is where it becomes really funny, it, it's a game, a game of multi-user adventures. It, it deals with collaboration. It, you can play the game, and as a player, you're, not only will you learn uh, enough about quantum physics, but it'll also, uh, con it will convert you to actually uh, you, can, you can share all your experience with other players and so on. So what it is, is that on the one hand, it starts with a very serious description of what quantum physics is going to do, and then it turns it into a game. And that's what I mean by the humor in the system. And I like that. Of course, it's not meant to stay that way. I think this is really a beginning kind of thing, We're playing with the system rather than simply making it function. But there are many other examples which you can see when you get to the, the, the slide. Uh, many other examples where it's not games at all. It's actually working extremely well and very seriously. So here, um, I even had, because we had to go back to McLuhan, I had a tetrad at the end, um, a tetrad on, on quantum physics. Nice way of, of finishing my conference here. It will enable the, the understanding and the interpretation of the cosmos as the inter interdependency of all being. It will dump, it will abandon classical physics and uh, classical entities and categories and classifications as separate things. And there was a lot of discussion about separation. It will recuperate the cosmic unity that aboriginals uh, had about all of nature. And it will dump, or it will, rather it will reverse in the responsibility of everything and everybody towards the totality of, of, of being. And this is why I was saying, looking at this mountain, we become responsible for whatever happens there. Now, that doesn't mean guilt, and I'm finishing on this, I swear. Guilt is not the future. And it's not interesting to talk about the environment in making people feel guilty about it. It's very much more important to talk about the environment as being the part of their body. 
That's what it is. We are embedded in this environment. And the way to we deal with it is the least uh, effective manner of actually having a happy environment and a harmonious one. And at that sense, I would be rather on the Chinese Confucian side. Thank you very much for your attention. Sorry have to have been so long, but it was a big topic. Thank you, Derek. I am taking the advantage to organize with you a panel to discuss the quantum physics in a multidisciplinary approach. Great. I'd love that. That's fantastic. Invite Maurice too. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, there is yeah, a question yeah. in, in the chat from Miguel D'Amato. Uh, Dr. Dekarkov, please could repeat the name of the book that will be launched. Is that Quantum Ecology? When yes, will be quantum. available for the for four case? Thanks for your great later. It's a long time, unfortunately. I'm rewriting it to actually accelerate. I'm rewriting it in for a different editor <clears throat> to accelerate the production. It's not going to be ready before the beginning of 2022, which is really, it, it's MIT Press. And MIT Press is very slow. I don't know why they take so much time, uh, but I can tell you I'm rewriting it. Um, I'm going to need help. And so I will have happily uh, be part of a, you know, your round table on this issue, but I'm really writing it. I am interested in writing it about the sensibility of quantum. It's a more of an art and uh, psychology issue. What kind of sensibility does the quantum allow to imagine, promote? You know, that's, uh, that's what, it, what I'm going to write about now. Someone else want to, to ask to the Rick or some comment for the final? Like say only thank you for wonderful, brilliant lecture. It's, on a, it's what can I say from my point of view? Thank you also for all these comments from Eric Maurice Benyon because he also was important what he said. So I want not, I don't want to connect my thinking to the so great professors. <laughs> Thank you so much, Adriana. It great. was really amazing experience this evening. Okay, lovely. Well, I, I, it was very great fun for me to meet you all and uh, re-meet others. And so um, be part of this uh, really exciting work that, uh, that uh, I had to, to do for, to make that presentation. And so, I learn my, I always learn when I make presentations and I've learned from also the questions. Thank you very much, uh, Maurice and uh, Mr. Andacht, uh, Fernando. <laughs> <laughs> and um, have a nice, whatever you have, uh, I'm gonna have dinner now. <laughs> have a nice sleep, Maurice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's time. It's, exactly, uh, one, applause. One one applause person. for you, Derek. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bravo. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ergo. Have a Thank wonderful you. evening. Bye-bye. 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 Good night. Oh. Good night. Good night. Good night. See, you. Bye. See you, you in the next. Thank you, Maria and in Lucia. Thank you very much. Yeah. Gracias. Thank you, Adelma. Because Thank you, Sagilla. Wonderful.